DNA replication, fidelity, and polyploids. Oh my! Oh my God, Ken Mitchell! Those topics and more in today's Biotrekkie with the Admiral, starting now. Hello, welcome back to Biotrekkie with the Admiral. I'm Mohammed Noor, a biology professor at Duke University and an occasional science consultant for the Star Trek universe. I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Jane Brooke. Hello, I'm Jane Brooke. I played Admiral Katrina Cornwell in the first two seasons of uh, Discovery. And I'm here now as Mohammed's friend and enthusiastic biology student, here to learn about biology here on Earth through the lens of Star Trek. Yes. So today we are going to talk about the final two part, uh, the two final two episodes. Um, season three. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Of season three. Uh, so Mohammed, the way we always start is to ask you, Biochecki, what struck you the most in these two episodes? Great question. So lots and lots of genetics that really got me. There was stuff about the tardigrade DNA, replication fidelity, uh, DNA mutation rates. Uh, it was all very cool. And that was all just in the first of those episodes, episode 12. I thought that was really cool. And I have a lot of thoughts on it. I should say, actually, I didn't contribute any of those pieces. That was all kudos to the writers for coming up with some really cool genetics in there. And then in episode 13, there was this interesting idea that Sukal was a polyploid. So I want to talk about that briefly. I was going to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then as a one-off, this is something actually I just noticed in passing. And, and I actually just thought about this earlier today before we recorded. Um, uh, Osira, the Orion. It was interesting. They've changed the Orions from previous series in that before they were very, they exuded this pheromone and they were very sexualized and stuff like that. And I noticed they did not do that now, which actually two thumbs up to that. I actually, I didn't particularly like that old version. So I was happy to see this new version. Very 60s. Yeah. The old version, right? <laughs> they had that also even in Enterprise though, even in the early yeah, 2000s. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I noticed the genetics, especially in, in episode 13, but, and I was like, yay, Mohammed has cool <laughs> genetics to talk about. But uh, so break down all those different, sure. I won't try to repeat them, all the different things that you noticed. Sure thing. So let me start with some of the quotes from episode 12. So in episode 12, there was uh, Paul Stamets said, the tardigrade DNA that fused with my DNA was from a species that is long extinct. I've tried to replicate it and it's been corrupted. You'll have to, you'll probably have to kill me to extract it. And that was a very interesting comment. I wasn't sure why he said that, because if you think about it, people have direct to consumer genetic tests all the time. We don't die in the process of getting those. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and part of the reason for this, we have so many cells. So typically speaking for one of those direct to consumer genetic tests, and I'll talk about how those work in just a second, because I thought that'd be a good entry point for going into that. But usually like you, you put like something like a Q-tip and, and uh, touch the side of your cheek, or maybe you swirl some liquid around, spit into a tube, or possibly from a blood test, something like that. You don't need many cells, you just need a couple in there. And I'll talk about why that is in just a second. So I have some head cannon. So this is not, now not Star Trek, and this is head cannon for why it might be that it's Stamets would have to die for them to study his tardigrade DNA or analyze it. Now, Stamets, if you remember it from the first season, the one, one of the ones you were involved with, um, he injected himself with something that gave him this tardigrade DNA, right? Mm -hmm. So now one of the issues that comes up in sci-fi in general is that when there's any sort of DNA thing, they just assume for some reason, I'm not talking about discovery, I'm talking about all sci-fi. They right. assume that whatever the effect is like the entire body, which doesn't actually make any sense. Like why would it be in every one of your like trillions of cells? <laughs> so that's what I would have assumed too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The headcanon I have for this, and I'm, I'm using some pun with the word headcanon, is that maybe that tardigrade DNA actually went into some handful of neurons in his brain. And that's uh, how he's able to communicate with the network. And it's not even clear which cells it is, just a small subset in there. So for them to get that DNA out, they may have to pick those cells that have it out of his brain. They'd be picking out bits of his brain. So that might be the, that might be uh, why he'd have to die. So that's my, that's my head cannon to, to retcon why <laughs> that would be I great. thought he was just saying it, you know, you, you're buying yourself time, you know, you're, you're, you're tight. You're, you're just saying stuff to buy yourself time. It could be, it could, and, it could be, he was just your opponent off. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. could very well be, that could very well be. But I like your explanation better. <laughs> At least makes it real. And then it's also a little yeah. sad here that the tardigrades apparently are extinct now. So that, that was a little sad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
But um, in terms of genetic tests, usually what happens, you just need a couple of cells. But the problem is that a couple of cells don't give you enough DNA to analyze. You need a lot of a lot of copies of the same DNA. So I mean, one option would be like if you were working with um, with a fly, you might just grind up the whole fruit fly. So that's something I work with. And so you have a lot rather than just a couple. But for us, I mean, we don't like to do that. There's a couple of ways you can do it. There, there's an enzyme called a DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase just makes copies of enzymes. And you don't have to do that in cells. You can just do that in a tube with you know okay. the right conditions and things like that. And if you put in the, the raw nu the nucleotides, the ACGT, just sort of the raw ones, it'll just assemble it for you. It'll make lots and lots and lots of copies of that DNA. Ooh, I'm getting really bright for some reason. <laughs> I don't know what happened, so you don't right? have to cut off someone's arm, you know? No. To, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. You can get plenty of things that way. So that that's that's really good. And that's something that actually, the, the polymerase that's used for that is something that it goes through these cycles where you have to separate the DNA, have the polymerase bind on, the uh, polymerase makes a copy, and then you separate the DNA again. Now, one of those steps actually happens at fairly high temperatures, like 94, 95 degrees Celsius. So it's like boiling, right? Mm -hmm. The polymerases that we have in our bodies would just die. They wouldn't be able to do that. But so the polymerase that's that's often used for you know standard uh, molecular biology was actually derived from this thermal vent bacterium called uh, Thermus aquaticus. Ah. So it's called TAC for the T from Thermus and the AQ from aquaticus. You put those things together, it's TAC polymerase, and that's the polymerase that's used. And it's interesting, this was a basic science thing that came out. Somebody was really interested in these, like, these bacteria and thermal vents, and that revolutionized molecular biology for everybody. Oh, and this happened, oh, like, I think cool. the original studies were in, like, the 60s, and then the, the, the PCR, this polymerase chain reaction that people use, uh, it was associated with a, a Nobel Prize in the 1980s. But do, do you mean by thermal, what did you say? Thermal bacteria? Do you mean yeah. like bacteria that survives in like hot springs and exactly, things like that? Exactly. I'm glad you asked that. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> so that was really cool. Yeah. Now, Stamets also talked about this thing where he said, or maybe it wasn't Stamets. Maybe this was, um, uh, I forget, what's Ken Mitchell's character's name? <laughs> Ken? No, wait. Uh, so, Aurelio. Talk... That, that was his name. Yeah. Aurelio. Ken's oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Aurelio. Yeah, yeah. Ken's character. Yeah. Yeah. He made some comment like... Um, Growth marries the fidelity of the copy with the vitality of new be beginnings and fidelity is always an issue with replication. It's actually very important too, in the sense that like when you make a copy, you want that copy to be exactly right. The more right. mistakes there are, the worse it is. Now, this is, this is, this is kind of, this is true, but the importance of it is a little bit funny. And now we actually, within our bodies, we are not absolutely genetically identical. Like if you took all of my cells here and all my cells like from opposite pinkies, they're not gonna be genetically 100% the same because mutations do happen as cells divide, right? Okay. So, and there's not gonna be like tons of them, but actually there was a study that there was a news article that just came out within the past month or so that talking about like identical twins are not exactly identical. You find on average X many differences between them. Again, it's the same sort of thing because again, they're, they're once they've divided, now they're on their own evolutionary go, trajectories. Right, yeah, yeah there's different I've, I read that once, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's kind of cool. Um, now, the tricky thing there is that uh, in the show, they said something about like, well, we can go back and we'll just put this, well, we'll use the cell and we'll have a, a better copy, but that's not going to fix any past mistakes, right? right? It's kind of like if you, if, you have a, if you have a book where some a page is faded, you can make copies. It's not going to get better. <laughs> no, you're not, that, yeah, it's not going to, yeah. Yeah, and Star Trek actually has covered that really interestingly in, in Star Trek The Next Generation. They, they had this thing called uh, replicative fading. And I, this is a term that Trek people made up, the Trek writers made up. But honestly, I think it's better than the technical term. Oh, how great. <laughs> right? But it's replicative fading. They had these people who were clones and they were a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone. And they started right. having all these problems because again, you can't fix it, <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> you yeah, because to, you have what you have and then you can only go from there to the exactly, next copy. Exactly. Yeah. But I thought that was very interesting and, and very poignant, the, the comment about fidelity is always the issue with replication. That was really good. And again, no credit to me. That was that was all the writer's room who put that together. So two right. thumbs up for them. So and, do you want me to move on to the other one or do you have questions about that first? Um, well, no, I asked the question about would these be bacteria in hot springs that, that you know, that yeah. immediately... Um, yeah. And I'm glad that you clarified that a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy can't go back to the original. Exactly. Um, so it's not obvious why if they if they took Stamets' cells out and put them into something else, like, okay, well, it's going to be a copy of Stamets' cells. It's not going to get better. Now, right. now, one interesting thing now, presumably, that this is far enough in the future, I'm assuming they can just synthesize long stretches of DNA. I mean, we're, we already can synthesize pretty well, you know, stretches of DNA, not, not like whole chromosome size, but we can do it pretty well. I'm assuming by that far in the future, they can do that. So I think they should be able to just, you know, if they have a, a 
you know, a computer program that has the genome of a tardigrade, they might be able to just print out the whole thing. Wouldn't that Maybe. be so cool? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Suddenly <laughs> of course, we have there's a lot dinosaurs of other stuff that has to go and... in too. Yeah. Yeah. No, right. Yeah. <laughs> <All> <laughs> then again, we have Jurassic things. Park. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jurassic, it reminds me of Jurassic Park. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so what was the, um, what was the other, you had three it seems like you said there were three, three or four things about the genetics. Yeah. So the yeah, it was, was a minefield for you. It was. Like it was. Mine. I was like, yeah. yes, there's so much to talk about here. I love this. <laughs> so they mentioned this was now in episode 13 rather than 12. Um, Dr. Culber, when they were talking about like how is it that he he survived here and you know, things like that, uh, Dr. Culber made this comment saying, uh, "I think Sukal might be a polyploid." So polyploid. This is very interesting. So. We are diploids, di-ploid, right? So we have two copies of all our genes, right? One, right. one we got okay. from mom, one we got from dad. Polyploids have, as the term might imply, more than that. They have like multiple copies from both parents. So the parents, rather than giving like just one copy, they may give two copies or they may give four copies or something like that. So, At, you, so oh, you as an individual might have like eight total copies of your genome rather than just two like we do. So that's, and that's in, interesting. In real okay. life, I mean, you might not have finished explaining, but in Go real ahead. life, well, you finish explaining if you need to before you answer this question, but what would be the advantage? Ah, of, great, great question. Yeah, so th there are a lot of species that we know that are polyploids. So cotton, potato, um, some wheats. Um, if you want a Star Trek reference, there's triticale, which I don't know if you remember from original oh, series, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those are all polyploids because they have multiple copies. Now, it, there's a couple of different ways that might be helpful. So generally speaking, it tends to be associated with somewhat larger cell size. And it, people say it's to hold the DNA, but that's kind of silly. I mean, I don't, I think they could hold the DNA without having a bigger cell, but they tend to be associated with bigger, uh, bigger cell size. Often you see polyploids in very stressful conditions. Right. In various so, stressful conditions. So and I don't mean like like psychologically stressful. I mean like drought. No, but, uh, ice, environmentally. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. To make Isolinity. sure one of them survives. It's like it. make sure something survives. To yeah, carry I'm not on, sure right? exactly what it does, yeah. but we tend to see that there. So this was very interesting that this was a possibility for being true for this guy who's in this radiation filled environment. Maybe there's more copies to use as templates for repair for his DNA or something like that. Right. I thought that was a, I thought that was a really neat idea. The other thing about it is it just makes him different from right. other Kelpians, right? So one, this is more now like headcanon stuff. This is something that Dr. Aaron McDonald and I have been uh, trying to flush out for an article as well. Uh, oh. <laughs> one thought is that by virtue of being a polyploid or other aspects of his epigenetics or something like that is his vocal cords are a little bit different. And that might be why when he screams, his vocal cords act at the resonant frequency of dilithium. And then that's what <laughs> causes that's like, this. Ah, uh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, that is a good, um, that explains a lot to right? our audience <laughs> so about it, that scream. Exactly. It connects everything there with respect to the, you know, Sue call being different. It connects to his connect. It has this connection with dilithium. And then it has how maybe he actually could have contributed to the burn. Right, so. the combination of him with all that dilithium. Yeah, exactly. So dilithium, oh. this is now I'm I know, 100% credit to what I'm about to say to Dr. Aaron McDonald. This is not on me. This is this is <laughs> totally on her for this part of it. I worked out the biology in terms of the polyploid stuff like that, but the, the, the rest was her. So dilithium exists in both normal space and in subspace. Right. right. I and was going to ask you about that. Exactly. Yeah. And it controls the matter-antimatter reaction. That's what ships use. So, so basically they, they put, for example, like matter and antimatter together, which normally should just go, you know, kaboom, but right. instead, instead of going kaboom, that it's this controlled thing and dilithium is helping control that. And that's what's helping things happen with the ship. So if something were to go at the resonant frequency of dilithium, potentially in regular space, you might sever that connection to subspace, which then would oh. make that reaction go crazy everywhere. Hence burn. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like the <laughs> so, atomic bomb of all time. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. And right. then it can go much faster than the speed of light because you're working with subspace, which doesn't have the, right. the same laws as normal space. So there you go. What <laughs> is subspace? Take, give a moment to talk about subspace. It I mean, they say it and you're watching and you go, okay, subspace. Yeah. But if you actually asked me, what Jane, are you actually thinking subspace? That's again, that one, and that's like a better basement? question. That's a better question for Dr. <laughs> McDonald than for me. But oh, okay. my, my yeah, impression is that yeah. that term is not used outside of Star Trek. It's not like, like you would never go to a, 
um, a, co a cosmologist and they'd be okay. like, oh, let's talk okay. about some space. But I think it's something that's basically just operating outside of normal space yeah. time. Yeah, okay. okay. Something along those lines. But she could, I'm sure she would give a much more eloquent description yeah. of that than I would Well, give. we'll get her on sometime and have her talk we to us that. about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and now there was an, there were, I think, two more genetic um, things that you noticed. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Was it? I think I hit them all. Yeah, target did you get... DNA, replication, fidelity, mutation rates. No. Oh, okay. Maybe you did cover yeah. them all. Yeah. No. I think I, I think I I think I was fairly brief on some like mutation. Well, like I said, not, it's not the same DNA in your two pinkies, for example. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> well, like I said, it was funny when they. I didn't catch it as much in episode um, because I'm not a biologist. Episode twelve, but episode thirteen, when yeah. they very very clearly were focusing on Sukal and everything, yeah. I was like, oh yay, this is be a good genetic thing. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't think I have any other questions about the biology of anything. Yeah, no, um, it was just, it was just the only thing I could really... think of is that in biology, when we were exposed to radiation, I mean, obviously they had, you know, they were slowly, yeah. it was a burn. I mean, the radiation burns were increasing on their face and hands. And yeah, I yeah. guess that's how it I works. love the scene there too, where this is that's not about the burns, but I was thinking about because his face was there. But I love the scene there oh. after Sukal watched the video and he looked back and Saru was then back to being a Kelpie. And he yes. Went, oh you are a Kelpie or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I just thought the whole, I mean, well. Please. You can ask me, well, I mean, I wrote a bunch of notes. On oh, please, I mean, you're probably about 13, to say what I'm about just, to ask. <laughs> well, just, just once again, uh, um, I, I just think the show is just so great this year. I, I just, I really can't think of one thing that, I mean, I just think it's fantastic. I think Jake Weber, I mean, I'm just looking at my notes and these are random notes because I think the thing I always notice first being an actor is I'm always like, oh my God, they're really good. They're really good. Yeah. Um, and also the writing, yeah. which I'll get to um, at the end, which is so great. But Jake, you know, I just do shout outs to Jake. I loved mm -hmm. when Mary, when they put them all at the beginning of 12 into, you know, they they captured the whole bridge crew and Mary's like, wait, 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 wait. I'm the captain. You only need to take me. Yeah. I mean, I know it's the writing, but it's the actor delivering it. You know, yeah. um, I really like that. I continue to really like Admiral Vance. He's very yeah. believable and, and strong and, and also kind. And I just really like him. And a lot of people oh online were speculating God. he was actually a bad guy, but like, nope, he was just as nice as he appeared. <laughs> well, because he had been through the burn or, yeah. you know, or the, the results of the burn and, yeah he had to be suspicious and he had to be on his toes and he, mm -hmm. um, he couldn't trust them right away. So, but, oh my God, the joy when I was watching and you had warned me, you said, Oh, Jane, I'm not going to tell you, yep. but there's a scientist on board episode 12 and I'm not going to tell you it's a surprise. And I didn't really give it a lot of thought because I thought yeah. I'll just wait, but I just loved seeing Ken, Ken Mitchell for those of you. And, um, he did a great job and he, he just has, Ken just has such a, uh, such a core of dignity about him that can't yes. help but come out when he's playing a Klingon, a bad yes. guy, a good guy. I, yeah. It just, it was just great to see Ken. And, yeah. um, and, and out of makeup now, he wasn't dressed as a Klingon. And like out of makeup. One's core or, you know, those so people. we got two joyous out of makeups. Yep. You know, we got Doug and we yep. got Ken. Isn't yep. that great? Two <laughs> wonderful men. And then um, I, like, I like Osira more and more. You know, she's a bad Same. guy, but I know she's a bad guy. Uh, she's a badass bad guy by the end, which I like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. The lie detector, I thought was hilarious. The lie detector guy, you know, when they <laughs> yeah. did that. And that whole scene, I mean, I mean, I'm still in episode 12, that whole scene between Admiral Vance and Osira, I thought it was a great scene. And I thought it was great metaphorically, like she almost represented big business corpse, yeah. you know, destroying the world, you know, for, for money. Um, it was, I didn't, the, the wonderful writing, I'm, I did not get lost on, on me, you know, the metaphors and the messages being put across. I'm just looking at my notes from one episode, you know. I love the sphere data. How cute were they? Oh, yeah, the you dot know, the 23s. dot 23s. Yeah. Oh my God, when they came around, they were so cute. What do you um, think those were? Do you think that was fully CGI? Or, um, I'm just speculating. Yeah, you know, it's so funny because when I watch something, I kind of watch, I realize afterwards, I watch sort of like a little kid. Like I just... I just believe everything I'm watching okay, <laughs> you know, unless something, unless something just really sticks out. Like I don't, there are times when I have said, how did they do that? Um, but the sphere data, the dot 23s, I just was so enchanted by them that I hadn't considered um, 
but I'm assuming they were computer generated. It would be six of one, half dozen the other. I mean, robots are created all the time these mm -hmm. days, but I, I'd be surprised if they were real robots. I, I would say- Well, I'm were. sure, I wouldn't assume they were robots, but I was wondering sure if they, somebody would have like a little stick that they were moving around. Kind oh of yeah, like somebody Molly probably, yeah, <laughs> somebody probably had a stick for each one, you know, yeah. uh, look here, look there, or yeah. at least to the one that you're looking to. Yeah. You know, Mary had Good to say, her. are you the sphere data? Or are you gonna, you know? Or oh, so we'll she have had to, to look, look at something somewhere. saying, no, you shouldn't have come here. <laughs> oh, you just froze on my side. What'd you say? Oh, sorry, looking said, at uh, something that said no. Oh, oh, what's the gun? Had to say, uh, had that line like oh you shouldn't oh. have come here <laughs> oh right right because you know you're gonna get killed yeah. yeah that oh and i was so glad she got to be the hero yes the heroine she's great and, um, she's also badass <laughs> she was great you know i i mean i i kind of thought they're not gonna kill the bridge crow they can't but they you know brought it close didn't they they you did know? they um, did so do you uh, think michael Byrne was barefoot for the entire second episode <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, she, her poor leg. I was like, I oh man, you know, how is she going to get out of this? But she was tough. Yeah. Um, just everybody. I continue to really love Book and yeah. just, you His know, just stellar. everybody, you know, and, and she the bridge crew. is a queen. <laughs> yeah, she's a queen. And then they gave that whole heroic storyline to the whole bridge crew working together to save Discovery, really. So that was great. But, um, uh, yeah, that was just the whole thing. I'm trying to see um, my biggest like shout out, not my biggest shout out, uh, but something that I just loved. I mean, this is me wrapping it up possibly too soon, but I just loved the messages without it, it not hitting you over the head, not, 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 um, they were just beautifully written. And that last show coming round to the idea of connection and the importance of connection. And that not only spoke to the situation that we're in in the world today, but it spoke to the whole history of Star Trek in a way that having not been a Trekkie growing up and being introduced to Trek in the past few years, I've had to catch up to this idea that Trek is universal, you know, um, inclusive of everyone, you know, and has been from the beginning. And I now, you know, obviously being introduced to Trek, I see that, but they did such a beautiful job yeah. talking about connection because yeah. we are all connected. We have to stop these disconnections <laughs> from each other. We're all connected. I thought that was beautifully written by Michelle Paradise, you know, just beautifully agree. written. I understand. Agree. You know? Actually, we have a soapbox on that point. So I'm glad, I'm glad, oh, you, okay. brought up, I'm glad you brought up Ultra. Actually, I have a Soapbox. And you have an actual soapbox. <laughs> Zest. Now we want to see My you stand placement. on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but that's cool. So, like reading online, you know, there's a lot of overwhelming enthusiasm for the show, which I'm very enthusiastic. I, th I think it's been fantastic. I think these last two episodes were some of my favorite Trek of all. Like, you know, yeah. there's 801 episodes out now. These were these would these would be in the top 10 for me. Like, these yeah. were fantastic. There are, not surprisingly, as with anything on the internet, <laughs> there's people- Yeah, who there's like, always someone who's going to complain. There's always exactly. someone who's going to complain. Rumble, and grumble. I'm always like, oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's a shame too, because you know the people who are complaining are people who actually like Trek, but they're like, oh, new Trek, blah, blah, blah. So, And this is the same people who for season one were complaining about the the, the spore drive right. for season two, were complaining about the Red Angel suit. Now they're like, oh, the burn, that wasn't nearly as interesting as it should have been, blah, blah, blah. Old Trek was so much better. And it was funny to me is they sometimes say that about the science. So this is where my soapbox <laughs> comes in. <laughs> yeah. I want to remind people, because I think there's some romanticizing of Old Trek, which I love Old Trek too. I'm not criticizing Old Trek by any means, but like, let's talk about the original series. One of the very first episodes of the original series, I think the episode was called something like Where No Man Has Gone Before. Right, Gary yeah. Mitchell is on the Enterprise. He is infused with energy and he turns into a god. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so people say, oh, that's original series. Oh, that's prehistoric, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, let's talk next generation. Wesley Crusher. This was the you know, a, a, you know, recurring character in the show. He was really, really smart. He got to be so smart. Just by being smart and being a little hormonal angsty, he was able to stop time. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> and that's not even touching things like Q or Trelane or any of these other things. Like, right. It's, it was, I mean, this is, this is, this is, 
fantasy and writers it's, have that's always exactly used, the next thing I was gonna say. It's fantasy, it's science it's fiction. Science and it's fiction. Fiction. It's right. not National Geographic, it's not the Discovery Channel, it's not Animal Plant. Like this is a fiction, it's, it's great stories. That's what it is. And right. And just like here, we're saying, oh, let's use Star Trek to learn about biology on Earth. We understand, you know, but also you can use fiction and fantasy to tell a story that you exactly. might not tell effectively straight nail on the head. Exactly. So that's why I bring exactly. up the metaphor of Osira sort of seeming to represent a, um, you know, a kind of corporatized world that's exactly. just only interested in money and not interested in the environment or whatever, mm -hmm. just money, money, what's the bottom line? Mm -hmm. um, not interested in human souls and but the you know the, the thing about change and people i i understand on a human emotional level that when people watch it and they go this isn't the old star trek i think let's just throw this out there if it's helpful i think that what's happening within and i'm not a psychiatrist but you know you have a great memory and nostalgia about your childhood or watching exactly. something with your dad or watching so you talk about romanticizing and it feels very good and now you're just you in the mo in the mo nor present time yeah. with your and you're having to pay bills and life is yeah. difficult or what, you know yeah. whatever i mean i'm just thinking of myself no, sometimes fair. but and it, things can I just go, what, what, what gets better? What survives without change? I mean, yeah. water that just lays there without new water coming exactly. into a pond and old water going out becomes stagnant. Yeah. And unless you imbue it with new thought and new energy, it, it dies. You exactly. can't keep something the same. And, and huge credit to, you know, Alex Kurtzman, Michelle Paradise, uh, Brian Fuller earlier on, all the, the writers, all the actors, including you as well, <laughs> all the production people, like, these are people who brought us new Star Trek. We went, like, for the last four years, we would have had no Star Trek. Yeah. This is fantastic. I love it. I think it's great. You know? And also, it's so easy to, I think criticism is important in the world, you know, a yeah. really fine critic, if you can, if yeah. you can find a really fine critic, yeah. they can up the game of exactly. a you know of a playwright exactly. or something exactly. like that but if criticism becomes just like let's try to pack it something let's find yeah. the one i didn't like those people's shoes you know you miss the big picture and i don't know i yeah. i i just i agree I agree and also it's, it's everybody easy has to, to love criticize it. it's fine if some people don't like it okay fine you know change oh, yeah, it's fine or yeah everyone can have the, some people won't like it <laughs> you know let yeah. the rest of us who love it keep loving it <laughs> right right and criticism uh, it is always easier like it's really hard to make a TV show or a film. I mean, it's I so hard to, and so they do such a great job. I mean, the acting's hard and the writing's hard and the CG is hard and the directing's hard and the lighting is hard. I mean, like oh, yeah. everything's a lot of work and these are yeah. people doing their very, very best. Exactly. You know, exactly. and it's pretty amazing. Exactly. So exactly. No, I'm very happy with the project. And again, like I don't I'm not saying that everybody has to love it. You know, fine. No. Everybody can have their own opinion. But you know, just I want people to remember that like this is a trick we have. I think it's great. A lot of other people think it's great. And you know, some of the specific criticisms I do I do take issue with in terms of the science. I mean, the science on. criticisms, yeah. The mere yeah. fact that I get contracted and Aaron McDonald's on retainer as a consultant, that's so much more than so many other franchises do right. on the science front for it. I mean, they right. really they're talking want to real to scientists to yeah. say, okay, my imagination wants to do this. Tell exactly. me how I can do that. Exactly. Yeah. And eventually, yeah. and in the end, story will trump science if it has to. But like again, it's science fiction. It's great. Right. We just right. want to have fun. <laughs> well, I've just had so much fun watching this season. I just think, Same. I just think it, you know, shot into a even higher level. I mean, I just think it was like, you know, sometimes I just, I thought it was great. <laughs> I loved it on every count. So agreed, agreed, agreed. <laughs> and I love talking about being able to watch it and, yes. and, uh, talk about science with you. Oh, yeah, yeah same. Fun. I love hearing your perspectives Thank you for on that it, idea. both on the science and on the production. I mean, I love you just hearing your second. You asked me questions and I was like, oh, yeah, that, that is really important. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. As well as your insights on production, too. So thank you for that as well. Uh, and I, I think this time for this particular video, uh, hopefully some people are potentially watching this with us in the chat live. So thank you for oh, being here I, with yes. us. That's right. I forgot that we were doing that. So, oh, when I, it comes out. We start right. guessing Hello, names. Hello, anyone no, who just, joins. Yeah, we'll <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we can type fast enough to answer questions. At least a good amount of them, hope. I hope. Yeah. Yep.
Cool. Well, that right. concludes well, great. season three of Star Trek Discovery's oh. coverage. With now we're going to have to try to do the thing. Now here's oh, yeah. the problem. Here's my problem. I can only do it with my left hand because I'm left-handed. Oh, hey, but you know it counts. But I does it count? I <laughs> yeah, think you I, mean, I don't, do I don't with know. Right hand. That's a good question. I don't remember. Does it have to be a particular hand? I'm I think sure. most people raise the right hand. But what about us left? Hey, wait, 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 wait. Oh yeah. Oh my there you god. Go. Thank you for tuning into Empire Trick. You, with Mohammed, the Admiral. to get me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.